Welcome to the sixth and penultimate session in a series we're calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organisations. And over a total of these seven sessions, which have been two weeks apart and we're two weeks away from the final one, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. Uh, we'll invite our guests to share their stories. We'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We'll also seek opportunities for you to get involved too. But perhaps we should start with our own introductions, uh, and clu- including our own pivot from learning to performance focus. And so I'll kick off this week. Um, my uh, my experience, uh, close to 25 years in ha- um, sorry, 25 years in L and D, 15 years of those in house. I was um, director of talent learning and OD at Disney uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, uh, my realization um, that uh, that I required a pivot was after ten years of becoming the very best classroom trainer, designer, and deliverer I could possibly be. I get into Disney, uh, and in my conversations with senior leadership, realize that the training that uh, that was my stock in trade wasn't going to help with the uh, the transformations that were required. Uh, they weren't going to uh, to help with the integrations of different functions that had to be not just per- have people perform differently, but had to get different results. And so I lent heavily on mini accelerated apprenticeships, which had me really reevaluate what it was that we actually did. And I think that uh, the delivery of content and the provision of online stuff is the dumbing down of our profession and that without the right conversations at the outset, it really doesn't matter what we deliver. Um, but that's perhaps enough about me. Um, Guy, if I can uh, perhaps hand over to you for, uh, for your introduction too. Thank you, David. Yes, my name is Guy Wallace. I've been in this learning and development or training and development business since 1979. And after working at a couple of companies, I became a ISD consultant in 1982. I, w- I think I'm one of the lucky ones when I uh, think about all the people that I've met over the decades Uh, On day one out of college, I went to work with people who had already been influenced and worked alongside of some of the people that became my mentors directly or indirectly. People like the late Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert and Bob Mager and Joe Harless. Those are just four of the dozens and dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of people uh, that I've met uh, throughout my career that had a performance orientation. Uh, coming from a training and development perspective. So their training and development that they produced was oriented to performance. And in doing that, they had to do analysis of the performance itself and then look at the enabling knowledge and skills. But in looking at performance, they would often uncover many gaps from the ideal state, if you will, uh, that were caused not by knowledge and skill deficits, but by other variables in the performance context. And so they began to look at how to address those, how to work with their clients to affect those variables so that they could truly uh, improve performance with or without instruction. And so that's been kind of my approach to all of this. And it's David's and my hope that this series will bring uh, to our audience Others who have made this transition uh, and to a performance orientation to both their instruction or learning and looking beyond that to what the true variables are that they might try to affect. Our guest today is somebody that I met back in the late 1980s at a professional society. Uh, We won't go into all of that, but uh, Dr. Steve uh, Villachica is a associate professor of organizational performance and workplace learning at Boise State in uh, Boise, Idaho. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for agreeing to join us today. Uh, Can you give our audience a little bit more of a background to, uh, you know, what's your experience been in this world? And, uh, um, And then we'll go into our questions after that. Uh, Thanks, Guy and David, for the opportunity to be here today to talk about performance improvement. I'm an associate professor of organizational performance and workplace learning at Boise State University. 
Uh, we're an online master's program. Uh, before that, I was a performance consultant for 20 years. Um, our OPAL program focuses on performance improvement. We're about working with adults in the workplace to improve organizational performance. So we do teach classes in performance-based instructional design. Uh, we also um, look at needs assessment or discovery. We look at uh, evaluation. We look at non-training uh, solutions to performance problems. Our program has been online since 1987. I teach courses in uh, foundations of the field. Uh, in addition to the instructional design course, I've taught our needs assessment course and other courses. I provide pro bono consulting to nonprofit organizations and to graduates of our program. Uh, in both our instructional design and our needs assessment courses, I coach student teams as they work with real clients on real projects to produce real world project deliverables. I'm also co-founder of a process management lab where my colleagues and I work with nonprofit organizations to help them improve their internal processes. Uh, we help them build internal capacity so that they can better meet their missions and serve their communities. Uh, before coming to Boise State, I was a performance consultant with DLS Group uh, we created performance-based training products. Uh, we conducted needs assessment and evaluations, and we also built large-scale performance support systems. Thank you, Steve. Um, can you share with our audience, what was your aha moment or you know, when did you begin to make this pivot? Uh, or, and did you make a pivot from approaching learning and training and instruction and, and seeing you know, the light at the other side of the room that there was more to performance improvement than just addressing knowledge and skills? Uh, yes, my pivot began in 1987 when I began working with Deborah Stone of DLS Group. Uh, at that point, I was a newly minted uh, master's graduate of a program called Computer Technology and Education. Uh, I'd also been working as an instructional designer a few years before graduating. And I'd spent a lot of time learning about learning and learning about technology, learning about education. And I had a passion for education. Uh, learning was good and more learning was even better. Uh, shortly after joining DLS, uh, Deborah introduced me to performance improvement in a lovely conversation over gin and tonics. Uh, Deborah became my boss, my mentor, and my friend. And the conversation unfolded as she mentioned that, you know, if you think about what organizations expect, they want people to perform in ways that help organizations meet their strategic business objectives. And sometimes people don't. And it could be that people didn't know how to complete a job task. And that's where training came in. And she also mentioned it could be other things in the workplace environment that get in people's way. They may not have the information they need. They may not have the instruments they need. There may be weird consequences that keep them from performing to standards. And in addition to the environment, it could be that there are individual factors that get in the way. Um, Motives might not align with organizational incentives. It could be the organization selected the wrong person for the job. Um, shortly after that, Deborah took me to my first conference of the National uh, Society for Performance and Instruction in 1989. And she began introducing me to all of her performance improvement role models, uh, the same people that Guy mentioned in his introduction. And she also introduced me to Guy. Um, and that work with DLS Group led to the job I've had at Boise State since 2007. Thank you, Steve. Um, since, since you started off in this, you know, back in the 80s, you, you most likely Refine, uh, re refine your approach to all of this over the years. And can you share us at kind of a high uh, level what works for you? And then we'll dive in and, and have uh, you explain it even further. But, uh, you know, what's the secret uh, to your approach from your perspective? Um, 
I think it boils down to two big things. Um, for early analysis and discovery, I use what's interchangeably called front-end analysis or needs assessment, needs analysis, performance analysis. Uh, the design thinkers now are calling it empathize. Uh, regardless of the names that we use, uh, this whole performance improvement thing is largely about uh, two components. First, it's about choreo choreographing a dance with potential clients and organizational stakeholders. The dance is about moving beyond their understanding of a situation and what they think they want. In other words, they come to us with well-intentioned but often ill-informed requests for training. We need to turn the conversation. We need to obtain their permission to use what Don Snyder in her uh, webinar called our performance lens. Uh, that means their permission to use all of our performance improvement approaches and methods, all of the box of tricks um, and, and approaches that we have. Um, and in addition to that choreography, which extends, it starts with the beginning of a request for training or a request for help, and it extends throughout a project. There's also this second approach, uh, and that's about using systematic and systemic approaches to build a shared mental model with clients and organizational stakeholders to engineer workspace ecosystems that meet strategic organizational objectives. Thank you for that high level. So there's Two things, it's working with the client and stakeholders. And the second is being systematic and, and looking at things systemically. Um, so can you dive deeper in all of that for us a little bit? So how do you work with clients and what are some of the challenges and, and how have you overcome some of those things? Uh, whether I'm teaching courses or consulting or working in our uh, process management lab, my performance consulting approach typically consists of uh, these things. Uh, first, gathering organizational intelligence to explore what's keeping clients up at night. And um, then qualifying requests for training and support in ways that bring adequate sponsorship to do right by the client. Um, from there, framing a problem or an opportunity in the form of gap between actual and desired performance. Then determining whether or not the gap's worth closing. If the gap ain't worth closing, we should not be spending lots of time on this. Uh, then identifying environmental and individual causes of the gap and how they interact at different levels of performance, how they interact uh, in, with the work, with the process, within the organization. And finally, given those causes, specifying feasible solutions that address those causes and describing how they'll work together to close the gap. And that isn't as linear as it may sound. Uh, typically, uh, performance consultants complete these activities in parallel and they work in iterations. Our models may look linear, but our practice is not linear. Um, so, going into each one of these in a little greater detail, uh, the first and ongoing step is gathering uh, what Ken Silber and Lynn Carney called organizational intelligence. I like that term far better than business acumen. And the reason is to have opportunities to improve performance, you need to know how the organization really runs. Uh, to have good, sources of organizational intel is going to help you work the organization. Uh, I use two different uh, big approaches here. One is drawing on the work of Gary Rumler and his anatomy of performance. And in that anatomy, uh, he has a cool diagram and it places the organization in the middle and its processes inside the middle of this diagram. And outside of the organization are things like the business environment and competition, uh, resources going into the organization and outputs from the organization going to shareholders and customers. Uh, what's neat about this uh, diagram is it's something that uh, one person or a group of people in a training department, for example, can start putting together and using uh, as a shared resource. 
Uh, but the whole idea here is that it's hard to get permission to improve performance if you're not aligned with what's keeping people up at night. Um, the second technique I use, I uh, stole from Tim Gillum and Carrie Mortensen, and their advice is to query the difference between official truth and ground truth. Official truth is what uh, Pentagon generals will tell you about a given military situation. Ground truth is what the dirty and tired warfighter in the trenches is going to tell you. Uh, knowing the differences between what an organization says about itself and what it actually does helps you navigate towards opportunities while av avoiding mine minefields. Um, the, I also scout for relevant, juicy, timely and useful gossip that can help me understand the organization. I want to know the stories, the epics, the sagas, the mythology that describe the organizational culture. I want to know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> uh, and together, these different sources of organizational intelligence help me understand and monitor organizational pain points and opportunities and other things to keep clients and stakeholders up at night, because that's where the opportunities lie. Uh, if you want to address resistance, address people's pain points. Don't try to educate them. They don't need it in their perspective. They don't want it, uh, but they can be open to help for things to keep them up at night. And so organizational intelligence helps us find ways to be useful rather than being a one trick pony that can only offer training solutions. Uh, the next part of this is responding to those requests for help. And it's really uh, about qualifying requests for assistance and making sure that you have the sponsorship to do that. So clients often come to us and they already have a solution in mind. Steve, I need me some training. Uh, it's similar to patients who self-diagnose their medical ailments and then go to their physicians saying what they want. Now, some clients have the skills and the experience to do this. Many don't. And when faced with any sort of request for training or assistance, savvy performance consultants choreograph a conversation. And I use that word choreograph intentionally. Uh, the first part of the conversation is about gently steering the client from the requested solutions to start focusing on workplace performance that actually keeps them up at night. Uh, Guy mentioned Joe Harless. I stole from him too. And my uh, adaptation of Joe Harless's uh, default response is, sure, we can help you with that. Can you tell me more about why this is important? And what about this is keeping you up at night? And that starts changing the conversation to start focusing on the next question is, what do you want people to be doing in the workplace that they're not doing now? And how is that going to help you meet your strategic business objectives? So the conversation is moving from that initial, I need me some training, to exploring the performance that would help them sleep. And that part of the conversation starts coming to a close when I can state the desired performance that we both now agree that they need. And I can link that performance to what's important to them in the organization. Uh, knowing what's important, then I can move to the next part of this, which is obtaining their agreement to provide adequate sponsorship for the project. Uh, Mark Rosenberg once noted that uh, there are different types of clients, and he gave them uh, interesting names, you know, clients that don't want to be involved and uh, really don't care if the product works or not. Uh, he called the living dead. Uh, and he also noted that there are clients that are really good, and those are the ones with he called skin in the game. And they agree to provide access to the resources that we performance consultants need to deliver workplace performance. They provide access to the extent data. They approve release time for people in the organization to work with us. They provide uh, release time for people to review our work as we're going along to make sure we're creating things that uh, will work as we expect. They provide access to interview and survey participants. They provide us with access to the subject matter expert uh, expertise that we need. 
uh, profess uh, preferably those SMEs are opinion leaders and water walkers that people in the organization turn to for questions and assistance. Um, and so this part of the dance is gaining agreement from the client to suffer significant short-term pain in terms of sponsoring the, pro the project in return for a long-term gain for getting the desired performance. Uh, this is an important gate in the process. Once we've agreed on a desired performance that's important and adequate sponsorship to deliver the performance, then a qualified project can move forward. Until then, you know, we keep coming back to the choreography and doing our best to reach these agreements. The next big part uh, gets into what things that are more common in the discovery, the uh, performance analysis needs assessment literature. Uh, so uh, given organizational intelligence, given client sponsorship and uh, an initial understanding of performance, we can now spend time really framing the effort, really beginning part of the discovery. And um, in her uh, interview, Don Snyder called it gap analysis. Uh, it's collecting and analyzing relevant data to specify a gap between actual performance and desired performance, and not just what the client presented to us, and not our initial understanding of what this may be. Uh, we need to do a deep dive to make sure that we've discovered the right things to move forward. Uh, Roger Kaufman called this part of performance analysis needs assessment. It's taking the time to frame the problem or the client is trying to solve or frame the opportunity that the organization's trying to seize. Um, our colleague, Roger Addison, likens this to detectives who are investigating the crime. Uh, in this case, the data that we collect and analyze and corroborate help us specify one or more gaps between actual and desired performance. Uh, having framed the effort, the next big part, and again, we're stealing from Joe Harless, uh, and it's really important is that once we understand or we frame that effort, it's really important to determine whether or not that gap is worth closing. Uh, sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, in academia, I'm sometimes uh, puzzled by sitting in a meeting where I look at the, the people, the number of people in the meeting, and there may be 12 or 15 or 20 people in a meeting, and they're looking to solve a problem. And the dollar value of the, the problem uh, doesn't even cover the salary cost of the people sitting in the meeting. You know, it's a problem that probably isn't worth solving. Uh, so not all gaps are worth solving. And performance consultants, um, use different techniques to make this decision. I use two. One is uh, down and dirty, and it's my preferred method because it's simple. And that is to align the performance gap with what's important to the client and the organization. Uh, so is it worth closing? Yes, if we can align the gap to the organization's mission, its strategic business uh, objectives, its current initiatives, its portfolio of big activities and things that keep clients and bosses up at night. Uh, the other way to determine whether that gap is worth closing involves some more investigative work. Uh, and it's to estimate a return on investment by comparing the cost of the gap to the anticipated benefits of closing the gap. Uh, depending on the client, the project, the organization, uh, this uh, estimated ROI might be something that's calculated on the back of a napkin or it could be formal costing exercises that appear in multiple spreadsheets and project proposals. But it's important to know if that gap's worth closing before we proceed any further. Uh, the next thing is given a gap between actual and desired performance that is worth closing, uh, then we move forward to what's called cause analysis. Uh, and that means identifying causes of the gap, and those causes exist in the workplace environment and within individuals themselves. Um, there are lots of different models for cause analysis. Uh, Guy has one. Uh, I often use 
and recommend that our students use either Roger Chevalier's updated BEM uh, or Geary Rumler's uh, performance system. Uh, and I found them particularly useful in my own practice, as well as teaching uh, students, as well as the fact that both are fairly client friendly. Um, those performance gaps are going to arise from causes. Uh, and if the performance gap is about solving a problem, then we troubleshoot the causes. If the performance gap is about seizing an opportunity, then we use cause analysis to identify and remove potential barriers to performance. Uh, in the spirit of Frederick Taylor, how do we set things up so we're likely to get the performance that we want rather than accidentally or sometimes intentionally placing barriers in the way of people doing their jobs? Uh, whether we're trying to solve a problem or seize an opportunity, the causes of a given underlying given performance are dip, typically numerous. Uh, and so it's common for performance gaps to travel in wolf packs. And it's common for the causes of those performance gaps, each individual gap uh, to be a multitude, a wolf pack as well. And they, these interacting causes um, produce the performance gap and the collection of performance gaps affects the organization. Um, if you are looking at the workplace environment, those co-occurring causes can include a lack of adequate information. Uh, people don't have the standards they need. They may not have access to use, uh, useful standard, standard operating procedures or other guidance. They may not have access to feedback about the extent to which their efforts are meeting standards. Uh, they may not have access to adequate instruments, uh, which means lean and efficient processes, as well as tools for expediting the processes. In many organizations, it's a real safe bet uh, that the processes are broken and the tools are inadequate. Uh, people basically do their best to complete job tasks despite user abusive software and shoddy processes. Uh, and you know this because they create shadow systems in formal ways to get things done because the formal systems don't work. Uh, the last thing in the environment we look at is consequences. Uh, it's a pretty safe bet that organizations find ways to reward the behaviors they don't want and punish the behaviors they do want. Uh, or in some organizations, there are no consequences at all. It doesn't really matter what somebody does on the job. Those environmental causes co-occur with individual ones. Uh, in addition to a lack of skill and knowledge, uh, you may have a lack of motives where the things that get people out of bed in the morning don't align with the incentives the organization offers. Uh, it could be a problem with capacity. Uh, sometimes organizations design jobs that no person can do. And other times organizations don't necessarily select the right person for the job. These causes often interact and performance consultants all often see uh, bad information confounded with bad instruments leading to wonky consequences and people who lack the motives to go to work because it's kind of a hard thing to do, um, et cetera. Um, the cause analysis is important and it's important that we kind of do these things in somewhat this order. Uh, because we don't want to start jumping to solutions before we know what the opportunity or the performance problem is, before we know it's worth solving. And then once we understand the causes, once we understand the causes, we circle back to what the client first presented, those solutions. Uh, and so the next part after the cause analysis is specifying feasible solutions. Um, uh, I like the term solutions. Other people call them uh, interventions. And to me, that sounds too much like bad reality TV shows. Uh, but there are families of solutions that performance consultants can specify that will address causes of a performance gap. So, for example, we can recommend and help an organization create missing standards or provide guidance in the form of job aids or signage or provide missing feedback that isn't there. 
Um, this is really important. This gets back to the choreography because typically performance consultants first start matching solutions to causes. Then we get back with clients and we review those solutions with clients and other organizational stakeholders to identify what's feasible and what will best serve the organization. And we have to do that uh, with them as opposed to to them. Um, there are times where we may even create prototypes depicting what some of these solutions may be, how they work and how they could work together to close the gap. Uh, we also start thinking about implementation of the solutions and the changes they will bring to the workplace. Uh, in an article that Tony Marker and I and some of our students wrote years ago, we looked at performance improvement and created our own model. But one of the things we noted is across all the performance improvement models, there are um, consistently two places that we call orphans. One orphan is implementation. Uh, implementation is something that should be started on day one, if not before, of any given project. And the other is, um, it's called change management, but I don't like the idea that we manage all the change. I think it's more back to the choreography and I think it's more change facilitation or change choreography. Uh, and, uh, that's something that we wanna be addressing before we pull this initial performance analysis or needs assessment done. Uh, and these are the analytical outputs, the discovery outputs that are then ready for further design development, implementation and change. And that's your story and you're sticking to it? That's my story and I'm <laughs> sticking to it. Well, well, thank you for that. This was very reminiscent uh, for me and thinking about some of, you know, all, all the people that you and I know and respected. Uh, some of them are still with us. Many are not. And they all have this, this structured approach. And, and you mentioned the BEM, which is Gilbert's Behavior Engineering Model, which many people have updated over the years. Uh, Roger Chevalier, who you mentioned, and Carl Binder has done the same. And yes. There's a lot of people who have these models and they can make this more simple. What, what you shared with us is complex because it, it, it is necessarily complex because critical performance, high stakes performance is complex and you need a way to begin to simplify it, to begin to analyze mm -hmm. uh, the piece parts and how they interact with each other, which is really critical. I really like the fact that you brought in you know, the, the need to work with our clients and stakeholders um, and bring them along in this whole process because it's it's tough to surprise them at the end with uh, a set of solution recommendations that that tie to causes that they may or may not really uh, know about and acknowledge. Uh, but thank you for that. So let me. Yeah. <laughs> it is the kiss of death. So uh, uh, David, what uh, what kinds of questions have uh, gen been generated here from uh, what Steve's presented thus far? Well, it's uh, sparked quite a lot of interest, Steve, and we've got uh, quite a few questions to uh, to get through. First of all, I'll say I do love the uh, the crime scene investigation uh, element. I think that uh, um, uh, performance analysis doesn't quite it doesn't really have a um, for want of a better term, like a, a sexy reputation here. I think that uh, the that learning needs analysis leading to a uh, a hero's a uh, training course is uh, is you know is, is an opportunity for learning and development to be the you know the, the the traditional sage on the stage and gain the plaudits. But I think the crime scene investigation uh, analogy there adds then the uh, the, the the allure uh, and perhaps you know something I I missed previously uh, something that I think would trump the old uh, training paradigm. Um, but we got some questions about the nuts and bolts of this, Steve. First, um, I got two two questions uh, linked: one from Lens and one from uh, uh, Alicia, and I'll and I'll I'll link them both together. So, uh, so Lens asks, uh, how long does it take uh, to shift a client's thinking from learning solutions to performance solutions? Uh, it really feels like a paradigm shift, and I'm curious uh, as to how clients most often respond. And linked to that, Alicia asked, how do you address resistance? Um. I think the, the start to, of responding to those questions is to note that DLS Group was a consulting firm. So when organizations brought us in, they already recognized that they had some sort of need or problem, and they felt they were already paying too much to us 
to solve it. Uh, and being able to go in as an external consultant has some advantages. Um, and so um, I think it's important to realize that it could be a different situation than when you're an employee inside of an organization. Um, so I'm going to try to address both sides of uh, that situation. So how long does it take to shift a client's thinking? Um, I can start shifting their thinking within a minute or so of starting that conversation. Uh, am I done? By no means. Uh, in our approach to project management, uh, as, as a project manager, I would be working on an, or a chief learning officer, I would be working with all of our clients on a regular basis and always returning back to the, are we dealing with the performance that's keeping you up at night? So I can turn the conversation relatively quickly, but I need to keep maintaining that shift in perspective because Lens, you're absolutely right. It's a uh, paradigm shift. Uh, and you're helping organizations make that. In terms of Alicia's questions about resistance, uh, I think resistance comes from multiple sources. I think the first source of resistance occurs when folks like us go to potential um, clients or sponsors, and we think it's our job to educate them. They don't want that. They don't think they need it. Uh, and I think resistance starts when they sense a misalignment between what they're asking us to do and the conversation that we're starting. Um, in his book on performance improvement, Bill Rothwell uh, suggests that it takes two years to steer a training department uh, to a performance improvement department. And one of his first steps is about educating um, executives and stakeholders and that may work for him. It's never worked for us. Uh, instead, I think the first step is to get in there and do the organizational intel work, the organizational intelligence work, and find out what the lay of the land is, how that organization really works. Where are the pain points? Uh, what are people worried about? Where are people's bonuses? Uh, and are they at risk? And I think finding places to be useful goes a long way in reducing resistance. Uh, the second way to reduce resistance uh, is part of the ongoing project management that accompanies all this performance improvement stuff. And so um, finding ways to be able to say, yes, that's a great idea. You know, let's look at how that changes the, the, the project and having a formal process to look at those ideas and say, uh, do we want to do this instead of something that we planned? Do we want to do this in addition to? If so, here's the funding uh, and having those conversations. And uh, Victor builds on Len's question, what besides dollars are the top influencers of learning or performance focused transformation? Um, I think the, the real big one is making sure that there's this ongoing alignment and realignment of our performance improvement efforts with uh, mission, strategic business objectives, initiatives, and things that are keeping people up at night. I've mentioned that, and it could appear that that's a one-time uh, event. It's not. Um, as we work on a project with clients, their organization's changing, their environment's changing. Uh, we don't work from steady ground. Uh, our work as performance consultants is more often than not accomplished while surfing. And we've got to be able uh, to align and realign our projects on an ongoing basis. And I think the alignment is the bigger issue uh, Vic, than the dollars. Uh, I know uh, Jack Phillips a while ago uh, wrote, what are the biggest issues in terms of training effectiveness uh, and its ability to produce a return on investment. And the number one that he and Patty mentioned uh, is this alignment with strategic business objectives. Hmm. And personally, I want to be aligned with things that clients value. Hmm. Uh, I like working in that space much better than doing things they don't value. Uh, I once worked, uh, we 
DLS group once did work in national security. And in the agency we were working with, the training and L&D function didn't even exist on the organization website, on the org chart, sorry. And uh, because they were so buried in the bureaucracy, it was really hard to get sponsorship to do the kinds of things we were trying to do. We have a question, um, uh, Steve, from, uh, from Anne, uh, who works in a nonprofit human service agency uh, that are heavily regulated by state agencies that require they follow prescribed training. How do you transform state mandated training um, which are generally information dumps with actual performance improvement. Oh, aren't they though? I feel your pain. <laughs> um, I, I think um, compliance training has always been a um, touchy or a difficult area for folks who want to do performance improvement uh, because the people who are regulators think training is the solution for everything or can think. Um, now, the neat thing is that not all regulators are created equal. And so while some regulators may think that all you need is a talking head and everyone's going to magically have awareness, uh, other regulators understand that systems need to be in place in order to produce the desired performance. So I think the first step is to get a sense of what your regulators really want. And if all the regulators want is something that your organization can put together quickly and easily throw out there and check the box off, um, then do it. It's not worth the fight. Uh, I think the other thing is to adopt a different attitude towards some of your regulators. And that is to start building relationships with some of them. So potentially go back to them and explore uh, the feasibility of saying, you know, uh, we're happy to create the training you want. We also don't think that that might produce the culture of compliance or the culture of safety that we're looking for. And we'd like to uh, potentially supplement that with these other things. And uh, depending on the regulators, uh, some of them will welcome that. I think the last thing is to look at what the compliance burden is and then internally working with your own stakeholders, your own executives and leadership board, start making decisions about how you handle those training requirements. So it could be that this is a simple requirement that we're going to meet using the least costly uh, method and we're going to be done. It could be that uh, we're doing work with the food bank now and food safety is big, warehouse safety is big. And our work with them has focused on uh, creating cultures of compliance and uh, having that conversation inside the organization of saying, yes, we're always going to have a compliance burden, but how do we move beyond merely responding to compliance burdens to getting ahead of the game? And for nonprofits that are often stretched uh, and, and working very lean. I understand it can be hard to have those internal resources. Uh, I'll be talking in a minute about our process management lab and how that's a joint uh, university nonprofit uh, partnership that helps them build capacity for some of these compliance issues. Great. Uh, we have other questions, Guy, but did you want to uh, continue with the, uh, the conversation and perhaps we'll come back if we've, uh, we've got the time? Yes, yeah, so we've got a little bit of time at the end here, uh, uh, maybe, uh, to uh, entertain some more questions. But uh, as Steve indicated here, uh, my one of my follow-up questions is, uh, can you give us a real-life example? And I think the lab that you talked about that you're doing it might be a, a source for that. So why don't you go ahead and share with us a little bit about that? Um. For almost two years, uh, what's become our process management lab has been working with uh, the Idaho uh, Food Bank. It's a statewide organization that uh, works with their partners to distribute food across uh, the state. Uh, Idaho is the second fastest growing state in the US and with increasing population come increasing numbers of neighbors who are faced with food insecurity. Then comes COVID. Uh, we've been working with our colleagues in the food bank to increase their food flow processes during the pandemic. 
Um, some of these efforts are focused and they are about streamlining parts of a larger food flow process that uh, begins with procuring donated food and then repacks it and then distributes it across the state. Uh, other efforts are broader in nature uh, along the lines of, for example, how do we recruit, train, uh, steward in ways that help us retain volunteers to support our organizational mission for nutritional education. To provide these services, we facilitate workshops with participants from the food bank. Uh, we used to facilitate them face-to-face -face with whiteboards and butcher paper and sticky notes and marker pens and stickers. Uh, come COVID, uh, we regrouped and figured out how to do this remotely using Zoom and a whiteboard software called Mural. Uh, each of our workshops is typically about five hours long. We'll work with the client to identify the people who are involved in the process who participate in the workshops. We'll um, start drafting the process, uh, the high level process, including those processes that occur before it and after it. And depending on the size of the effort, these workshops uh, are up to five hours long or so and we'll hold two workshops about 10 days apart. Uh, the first workshop is called the As Is Workshop and the second workshop is called the To Be Workshop. Uh, the As Is Workshop is about representing the current pro uh, process and its associated pain points. Where is the process not working the way we, we'd like it to? Uh, participants also prioritize the pain points in terms of their overall urgency. Uh, we'll provide a report uh, de depicting the process and its pain points after the workshop and ask uh, the team to review that in preparation for the 2B workshop. Um, in this second workshop, we review the process maps and the pain points. Do we still have this right? Do we need to make any changes? Then we spend our time uh, specifying solutions for the pain points and prioritizing them. And importantly, uh, we also spend time brainstorming and organizing the initial implementation steps for the high priority solutions. After that, we'll follow up. Uh, and what we've been doing uh, typically is working with the process leads to help them prepare presentations for food bank leadership. The presentations describe the prioritized solutions, progress to date, resources that the process leads and their team will need. Uh, and the food bank has now institutionalized these regular presentations and it's how the process teams and leadership coordinate their work. Uh, we've also uh, worked with them to provide more support for change facilitation because our work as performance improvement folks is always uh, intrusive. It's always um, disruptive. And uh, part of what we do is work with their leadership and their executives in terms of helping them navigate the changes to the organizations that the solutions bring. In a recent panel discussion, uh, their chief operating officer talked about how uh, this work has started reaching the distance uh, between the warehouse concrete and the carpet that are in the office. And they're calling it uh, concrete to, to carpet communication. Um, we also uh, have brokered uh, projects that go back to our OPAL department. And in our instructional design course, we are creating training now uh, for the task of preparing government reports. And we have student teams that are working right now with the one person in the organization who can do this mission critical task so that other people in the organization will be able to do this task in the future. Sorry, I went on too long, but. <laughs> no, thank you for, for, for sharing all that. Uh, is there a source for our audience to follow up to, you know, get, learn a little bit more about this, the, the process that you use and the tools that you use and, and the story that you've told? Uh, 
I've mentioned a lot of the models we're using in the, the course of this conversation. Uh, for the process management work, uh, we're drawing heavily on uh, Marcy Uday Riley's and Ingrid Guerra Lopez's chapter in uh, the 2012 uh, non-training intervention book. I'll provide the uh, reference for that after we're done. Okay, good. Well, that's a useful the, place. That's an introduction to this. Okay, uh, we'll, the other we'll, place to go is uh, reviewing uh, Geary Rumler's Anatomy of Performance. A lot of uh, what's become common practice in uh, process engineering, process management work, you know, arose with his work. Yeah, you mentioned the as is and the should be models, and uh, he created that. Uh, one of my co-workers back at Motorola uh, shared that uh, in the video at the uh, Rumler tribute uh, after his passing back in uh, 2008. It was the 2009 uh, ISPI conference uh, where he uh, lay, uh, gave credit to Rumler for, for that phrase, which was all things that led up to the creation of Six Sigma, as Alan was explaining it way back then. So what... It, it, as a kind of final question, what uh, what kinds of adaptations would you expect people to have to make? You know, there's not a road process for doing that. You've been clear about that. And so there's a lot of flexing that one, one needs to do. But what would be some of the key things that people need to be aware of that they're going to need to be very flexible and uh, as they navigate through this kind of work? Um, I think the first place for flexibility uh, starts with building that organizational intelligence uh, capacity um, that will let you start viewing your own organization through a performance lens. Um, so it, it's working with yourselves and others to find allies and start finding where the real pain points and the real uh, risks are. Uh, it's about finding ways or finding the things that are really important to organizational clients uh, and stakeholders so that you can actually propose things that they're interested in doing as opposed to uh, being the one trick training pony. Uh, I think at some point, an opportunity to improve performance will arise. It could be that, you know, you met a request to provide training within a ridiculously short time frame. Uh, it could be something else, but at some point they say, um, thank you. And when they say thank you, I think the other thing you can do is start being prepared to ask what you need from them uh, to do right. And saying, well, you know, we're, we're really excited to do uh, more work with you in the future. It would you know, we think we might be able to help you with this. Would that be okay? Or in the future, we really need uh, access to the uh, the subject matter experts who are also opinion leaders. Uh, we know that's going to hurt, but we think we have a way to use their time efficiently or whatever it is you need. But I think, um, you know, you can see in these general suggestions that it's always messy and it's always different and it's always going to vary from setting to setting, project to project, client to client. And I think your starting points are uh, knowing the lay of the land and your starting points are uh, being able to ask for the things that you need to do right by your clients. Thank you. David, what other questions do we have from our audience? Uh, well, we've uh, we've 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 got a, a few, and I think we can uh, we can cover off uh, Yao and uh, and Matt um, because we are uh, on the recording uh, in the show notes for the recording. We're going to have these supporting resources. Um, that Steve's already mentioned. Um, Yao's asked uh, here for uh, for some resources, best practice on consulting clients to conduct needs analysis before jumping to a solution. And Matt would like um, uh, to uh, to. Um, mention the two calls analyses again. He said uh, Roger and uh, and Gary. Um, we didn't get to uh, to uh, to other questions on here because it is time to uh, to uh, to wrap up uh, for now. 
Um, but uh, but but thank you very much, Steve. Uh, hugely enlightening, uh, and we could tell from the um, uh, from the interactions that we've had that you sparked an enormous amount of interest. That I think that we can uh, uh, we can uh, certainly follow up with with the uh, supporting uh, resources and also uh, with the questions that we didn't get to. And thanks, thank you to everybody who's uh, attended today. Uh, we've mentioned the uh, the recording uh, between the two of us, uh, Guy and I. We'll uh, we'll get the recording out to you hopefully uh, tomorrow, and so you'll see that uh, that not just mentioned on uh, on social media, but uh, but also uh, for everybody who has um, who's registered for this and for previous sessions, we will send out uh, a link. Uh, and we only have one more um, of these sessions um, to come, and in two weeks we're inviting Steve back uh, along with Sebastian. Um, uh, and Dawn, uh, and we're going to hand it over to you. So, so you receive also uh, next week uh, an email asking you what questions you have from here to help with your own pivot. Um, whether you're just beginning that or whether you're a little way down the line, there are lots of questions always about resistance, how long this takes, what you should do, uh, any uh, circumstantial stuff or situational where uh, you're trying to introduce this or you want to, but you anticipate uh, tricky stakeholders who perhaps are more used to uh, getting what they ask for all of that stuff is up for grabs and we invite you uh, to to ask those questions to come along uh, ask those questions and get involved in the conversation but also uh, to uh, to watch and share that video um, thank you again Steve uh, for that that was uh, that was great stuff and thank you everybody and hope to see you next time <laughs>